Growing up in a secular society, we can always come across people who like to tell us science and belief are incompatible or science and reason or faith and reason are just mutually exclusive. But that's simply not the case. Today, we're going to be discussing three powerful arguments for the existence of God, which would demonstrate that you can be logically satisfied with the theistic worldview. So before we get into the video, I'd like to give you a quick reminder to like and subscribe. It's completely free and you can always change your mind. Without further ado, let's get into the video. So before we get into these arguments, I would like to make a quick disclaimer. These arguments should not be seen as the only three arguments for God's existence or the strongest arguments for God's existence. I just find these three to be the most simple and the ones which are most easy to understand, yet are also persuasive and powerful in their own ways. Furthermore, I would like to make it clear that these are only simple defences of these premises and that there is a lot of literature out there about each of these arguments. So if you want more information, make sure you do some more individual research on your own. So let's start with argument one. This is the Kalam cosmological argument. While this argument finds its roots in Islamic philosophy, discussed by philosophers like Al-Ghazali and Al-Kindi, the argument's most recognizable contemporary defender is the philosopher Dr. William Lane Craig. As laid out in his book, The Kalam Cosmological Argument, the core syllogism can be summarized as follows. Premise one, Everything that begins to exist has a cause of its existence. Premise two, the universe began to exist. Therefore, the, the universe has a cause for its existence. Since this argument is laid out in deductive modus ponens format, the conclusion must follow from the premises if the premises are both true. So let's turn to the first premise of the argument. Premise one of the argument is supported by an important principle called the principle of temporal causation. This is the idea that everything or every state which begins to exist owes its existence to another cause. This is one of the most fundamental principles in our understanding of the world and is supported by powerful empirical evidence. A few examples. If we see a news report of a murder, we know that someone must have caused it. If you hear of a robbery, we know that there must have been a robber which is behind the disappearance of stolen goods. If we see water boiling, we know that there is a cause for the H2O molecules breaking down. In each of these three cases, we can see that it would be unreasonable to suggest that those who were murdered did not have a cause for their murder, those who were robbed never had a cause for their robbery, and water which is boiling in the stove, in the stove is just boiling ex nihilo and just does not have a cause. In the same way, it would be unreasonable to deny the principle of temporal causation. So how does this apply to the first premise of the Kalam? everything that begins to exist has a cause of its existence. Since we know that temporal causation is a real phenomenon, it only follows that this premise is well supported. That said, I would like to emphasize what this argument means when it says everything that begins to exist. Since we are currently discussing temporal causation, it only follows that only objects which are past finite have causes. Those which are past eternal cannot have an event which existed prior to their existence and hence do not require a further cause. Please note that this does not mean that it doesn't require an explanation. It just means that it, there does not need to be a further cause. So with that out of the way, let us turn to premise two of the argument. This is the idea that the universe began to exist. This is supported by contemporary cosmology and also by philosophical argumentation. To keep this brief though, I will only use two scientific examples which would demonstrate the truth of the, this premise. In science, we currently believe in a phenomenon called the Big Bang. This is the idea that around 13.7 billion years ago, the universe came into existence. Relatively prior to this point in time, the universe did not exist. So why do we believe in this model? Well, the reason is twofold. Firstly, we observe something called CMBR, cosmic microwave background radiation. This is the idea that we have low-level radiation 
throughout the universe. Scientists look at this radiation and postulate that this form of radiation is residual energy left over from the Big Bang and suggests that there was a previous high energy, high density state of the universe. Secondly, there exists a scientific law named the second law of thermodynamics. This essentially says that the entropy of a closed system is always increasing and never decreases. So when a system reaches a state of max entropy, the universe reaches a thermodynamic equilibrium. This makes it impossible for energy to be transferred, making it impossible for any action to be carried out. This means that the universe must have had its beginning, otherwise we would currently be in a stage of heat death. So it appears that the second premise of the Kalam is also in concord with scientific evidence, from which it follows, logically, that there exists a transcendent, eternal, and timeless, immensely powerful, personal cause of the universe. While this does not exactly take you immediately to the god of Christianity, it does get you most of the way there. The second argument that I would like to raise is an argument from morals, sometimes referred to as an axiological argument. The argument goes as follows. If atheism is true, objective morals do not exist. Premise 2. Objective morals do exist. Conclusion, atheism is false. Or, in other words, the proposition that atheism is true is false. Like the previous argument, this is formatted in a deductive modus tollens way. If the premises are true, the conclusion logically follows. So, when we turn to premise 1 of the argument, I feel that it is relatively non-controversial. Despite the efforts of Sam Harris and his works on the moral landscape and other philosophers who have tried to provide atheistic groundings for morality, I find these concepts lackluster and insufficient. While I will not go in depth with the criticism of Sam's work, I will raise a few pointers and demonstrate why his view is wrong. In his book The Moral Landscape, he suggests that human flourishing and well-being is a goal of mankind, and anything which promotes such a good or such a goal would be objectively good. Of course, this is a reduction of his 300 plus page book, but I feel that it is nevertheless an accurate one. Even without turning to the practicality of such a worldview, we can already spot a few flaws in Harris's reasoning. Why should human flourishing be good? Why not human suffering? What makes one objectively better than the other? Why not the flourishing of animals or the flourishing of nature? Humans do a lot of harm to the environment, but all of this harm, or at least most of this harm, is done to benefit our own flourishing. What makes our flourishing objectively better than the flourishing of these other factors? The flourishing of the environment, the flourishing of rainforests, for example. If we're just random stardust floating around as the result of the Big Bang, what makes some acts objectively better than others? Even the atheist Richard Dawkins admits that morality doesn't exist. In his own words, the universe we observe has no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. So it does appear that premise one of this argument is sound. If there is no God, then there is no objective morality. So we must turn to our second premise. Does objective morality exist? Well, this is the part of the argument where I feel that the atheist can just say objective morality doesn't exist, and hence defeating this argument. And in some ways, I'm fine with that, because denying objective morality comes with a very high price tag or a very high cost. So the idea of a price tag is essentially the idea that the acceptance or a rejection of a belief is so difficult and comes at such a higher cost, making it very hard to live according to such a belief. So when we turn back to the price tag of denying objective moral standards, we can see that denying objective moral standards raises the price tag significantly. It makes things like discrimination, rape, murder, all of these horrible acts morally subjective. In other words, one cannot really object to a bigot, a rapist, or a murderer on objective grounds. The opposition can just say, well, I don't think so. Furthermore, a lot of atheists love to use moral criticisms against the Bible. To demonstrate this, let me raise a few clips of atheist Hermat Meta, I think I pronounced his name properly, where he objects to Genesis on moral grounds. Is it weird that calling for the death penalty here is meant to be the moral response? I don't know how I feel about that. 
I just want to point out that Isaac became rich and the Bible says he used that money to buy slaves. And none of you even noticed that because the Bible just constantly glosses over slavery like it's not a big deal. You should be ashamed of yourself. Lot's wife didn't get a name, but the Wells do. Shows you how much respect the Bible has for women. As you can see, these criticisms of slavery and inequality in the Bible all betray a belief in objective morality. If, mora if objective morality didn't exist, how can anyone make a substantial moral criticism? The proponent of a somewhat dubious moral viewpoint could just say, well, I don't think so, I believe my view is correct, and then your argument would already fail because everything's subjective and technically anyone could do whatever they want. So it appears to me that premise two of the argument also appears to be true. A lot of atheists believe in the objectivity of moral values, and denying them does lead to an extreme consequence, a really high intellectual price tag. Since both of these premises are reasonably defended, the conclusion logically follows that atheism is false. Since both of these premises appear to be true, the conclusion logically follows that atheism is false. That said, one can get out of this argument by denying the objectivity of morals, but they just have to recognize the implication of such a suggestion. This brings us to the final argument that I'd like to raise. This is an argument from meaning and purpose. While it is similar to another argument, namely the argument from desire, this one has slight variations. But before we get into it, let me explain why I chose this argument instead of perhaps a more well-known argument like the resurrection. Well, there are many other arguments which are perhaps more powerful than this one. This argument's strength is found in its simplicity and profundity. Don't ask me why I chose these two pictures, I just felt like it and I think they look pretty beautiful. So now you may be thinking, don't profoundness and simplicity kind of contradict each other? Well, they kind of do at face value, but if you look deeper about its applications to this argument, I think that they do not contradict each other and, and in fact they complement each other pretty well. The argument is simple in its intuitive nature and profound in the sense that it comes with a deeper meaning. So how is this argument laid out? Premise 1. We all experience meaning, value and purpose. Premise 2. An atheistic worldview does not account for meaning, value or purpose. Premise 3. A theistic worldview provides the best explanation for our experience of meaning, value, and purpose. Conclusion, theistic worldview is most likely true. This argument is a form of abductive reasoning. This is the idea that one is arguing to the best explanation instead of a logically necessary conclusion, that which is a feature of deductive arguments which you have seen before in this video. This means that it is possible for one to just accept the premises and disagree with the conclusion. That said, I find this highly improbable, as it appears that if these premises are true, atheism, at the very minimum, is wrong. In order to figure out whether premise 1 is right or wrong, I think we must ask ourselves whether meaning, value, and purpose ex exists, or at the very least, do we experience that we have meaning, value, and purpose? Well, to, to answer this, I think we all experience meaning, value, and purpose. Building upon our last argument, the reason why we treat people with respect, care for one another, and love each other is due to a sense of meaning and value about those around us. When we hear about slavery or forced labor or abuse, we naturally and rightfully feel shocked and disgusted. We feel that someone's value, someone's worth has been abused and violated. When we hear that someone is going through a really tough time, and maybe contemplating suicide, you try to convince them of hope, meaning, and purpose, to find that drive in their life to carry on, that sense of light at the end of the tunnel. From each of these experiences, reflecting on our own lives, it is clear that we all believe in some form of meaning, some form of purpose, some sort of intrinsic value found within each of us. There is this aspect about the human nature which means something, an essence which goes beyond mere matter and motion. This suggests, this feeling and experience, suggests that premise one of the argument is correct. So what about premise two? An atheistic worldview does not account for meaning, value, or purpose. I feel that this premise is similar to the argument raised in premise one of my moral argument. To illustrate this, let us return to Dawkins' quote on pitchless indifference. 
as you can see from his approach, he is very nihilistic and pessimistic in regards to meaning, value, and purpose in life. He rightfully says that the universe, on atheism, has no meaning, no value, everything is indifferent, everything is meaningless. To illustrate this even further, let us return to our understanding of the second law of thermodynamics. If the universe is all that there is, and matter and motion are the only things which exist, one day in the future, probably in another millions or billions of years, everything would ultimately reach maximum entropy. Everything would reach a state of heat death, a universe where nothing can be done. No energy can be transferred, no actions can be carried out. A dull and pointless universe. This suggests that we are all doomed to nothingness, we are all doomed to oblivion. That is what humans are and what humans would always be. So it does appear that an atheistic worldview of the universe is quite pessimistic and quite nihilistic when it comes towards the meaning of life. Of course, one can turn to the existentialist movement. This is the idea that man can create their own meanings. However, there is a fundamental problem with this idea. Not only is it difficult for someone to synthesize their own meaning, in fact, most people, not all, but, but most, just return to Judeo-Christian sentiments and say that everyone is equally meaningful and valuable, this form of existentialism also fails in grounding any form of objective meaning. Sure, one can just create their own meaning, but it doesn't mean that their meaning is true or that it exists. It makes this form... It makes, sure, one can just create their own meanings, but it doesn't mean that this meaning is objectively true or that it exists. This form of meaning is just a sort of brain construct instead of something which is real or valuable. I can go on about this for longer, but I'll refrain from doing so lest we stay here forever. So it appears that this premise is also true, that on atheism, human life is meaningless, there's no meaning, there's no purpose, and there's no value. So let us turn to the final premise. This is the idea that religion, I'll be looking at Christianity in this video, provides the most sufficient explanation for our experience of meaning, purpose, and value. I feel that this premise is quite self-explanatory. In the first few chapters of the Bible, we can see that mankind is created in the image of God. In the New Testament, we can see that God loved us so much that he sent his one and only son to die for us on the cross. This gives us a great sense of reassurance. No matter how far we have fallen, no matter how sinful we are, God sees that we have purpose and value, so much so that he stepped down from heaven to die for us on the cross. So we can conclude that a theistic worldview, Christianity in this instance, provides the best explanation for our experience of meaning, value, and purpose, from which it follows that a theistic worldview is most likely true. So here we have it, three powerful arguments for the existence of God. Are there stronger or are there other arguments for God? Yes, but I think that these three are a good starting point when you're discussing the issue of the existence of God. They're simple, profound, and very helpful. So if you disagree with anything I've said or you like anything I've said in particular, show your support or your disagreement in the comments below. I'll try my best to get back to you as soon as possible. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you like and subscribe. Have a great week. I hope to see you soon. Stay safe and God bless. Thank you.